the stand now and uh, accept our um, our thanks for being with us tonight and also the uh, the honor of our <laughs> Thank you for being with us, and um, that was uh, a wonderful, wonderful honor. It's now um, my pleasure to move on to the second um, action item, which is the naming of the new elementary school at 10941 Kings Crown Drive. Dr. Hargens? Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. Speakers. Oh, I'm sorry. There are, yes, there are, there are speakers on that. Excuse me. There are speakers on this agenda item. Um, Mr. Stephen Imhoff is the first one. Mr. Imhoff, you are no doubt quite familiar with these rules. Um, you have three minutes. After two and a half, you get one bell, and three, you get two. OK, we'll use my watch here. <laughs> no, 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 no. But <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you for allowing myself and others to speak. Uh, this, is, this is a bit important to me, the name of the school, the name of the school. First of all, about 10 years ago, when we talked about having a school there, I voted to investigate and look at with the YMCA out there and whether we should have a school there. And uh, I wasn't 100% in favor of it, but, I, uh, but that's, that's moot right now. And I was then, I'm, worried, I'm trying to be consistent, I was worried about student assignment. I was worried about we have a school at this part of town or the other edge of town, and how can we maintain student assignment uh, and maintain the diversity uh, that uh, most, that we think is, is important, just makes it more difficult. I did say about eight, ten years ago that uh, I've always I've, I've promoted the name of Governor Weatherby, Governor Larry Lawrence Weatherby from Middletown, the only governor from, from Jefferson County, who is one of the top two or three education governors in the whole Commonwealth of Kentucky for the last 200 and something years. Uh, and, and by the way, if the, if the name stays the same as recommended, I, uh, I hope they can name a media center or a library after him. Uh, he grew up not far from where this school, this school will be. But the recommendation is not to name the school after a person, it's named after a commercial development. Norton Commons is a commercial development, not a person, uh, not an idea. Uh, and it's, we already have Norton Elementary uh, on Highway 22, which is Brownsboro Road, uh, named in part after the same people, George Norton. First of all, uh, uh, George uh, Norton Elementary is named after uh, Jane and her husband George Norton. I'm not sure when that, what year that was, but but now we've got a possibility of another Norton. And by the way, I know we have the we have the uh, 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 the Cochran with an E and Cochran without an E. But by golly, I know instances where I was at a meeting, somebody was supposed to be at the Cochran e, the Cochran downtown. They got they went to the one out way out in the East End, Southeast End. They got to the wrong place. So it will happen that people will go to the wrong building and be late for meetings. Uh, but more importantly, I just uh, certainly think that, uh, uh, that the name should be different. Than, I said it then, and, I'm, and I say it now. And I, I, really, I really fear that, uh, uh, that uh, at least there would be a sense of entitlement that this might be like a mini, uh, mini uh, charter school. And we want to keep the diversity that, that's necessary. So, for example, DuPont Manual was not named after DuPont Corporation. It's named after a DuPont that lived here 100 years ago, 100 <coughs> years ago in Louisville, Kentucky. So let's name it after a person rather than, uh, rather than, uh, than a commercial development. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker is Debbie Westland. <clears throat> Three minutes, bell after two and a half. Thank you very much. Yep. Superintendent Hargens, Chairman Jones, and board members, thank you for allowing me to speak to you this evening. I'm also here to ask that you reconsider naming this school after the Norton Commons development and to give you some compelling reasons why. The Norton Commons land donation valued at $6 million for a school and a YMCA was generous, and I advocated for accepting it. The board did its due diligence and conducted a comprehensive needs analysis before moving forward. I was glad when the project was approved. Now you are building a beautiful $17 million school. 
you've made good on that original agreement next as mr in hot said you already have a norton elementary just down the road i want to share with you this original program from its dedication in one nine hundred sixty seven mr and inside it says it is with great respect that the jefferson county board of education dedicates this school to mrs jane morton norton who had been on the school board and her late husband mr george w norton jr who have contributed so much to this community and his educational system these are the same people for whom you are being asked to name this new school <coughs> the same people you've been honoring them for 50 years already and you will going into the future further as mr imhoff said two schools close to close together with the same name will get confusing including possibly for emergency responders consider that the sir the school also will serve much more than the norton commons neighborhood whatever boundary option you choose tonight and whatever boundaries future boards approve. Your process to name the school began with lots of good nominations. I was at that first meeting, there were 50 or 60, I think. It included a former mayor who is a lifetime champion for JCPS, a judge who made great decisions in support of the system, former board members who led in difficult times, educators, administrators, legislators, and others but I don't think the process included a deliberative process where the nominations were really studied as they should have been. In closing, remember these things. You have met your commitment by building a beautiful school on that property that will benefit both parties. Norton Elementary already honors the Norton family, already does. This public school will serve more than one neighborhood. Finally, you don't build new schools often. Use this opportunity to leave a legacy for JCPS by honoring a public education champion. Don't make a quick decision to move forward. In, flat, in fact, Norton Elementary was called Brownsboro Road Elementary until it was open and dedicated at this time. Take time to do this right and honor the school system you lead by considering all the people who have helped make it great. Thank you, Ms. Wessel. Next is Marilyn Patterson. <coughs> Ms. Patterson, thank you for being here. You've got three minutes, one bell after two and a half. Thank you. Superintendent Harkins, the board, thank you for having us tonight. Uh, we appreciate the opportunity to speak. Uh, first and foremost, we just want to thank you for your consideration in naming the new school Norton Commons Elementary. Our entire community is excited about this. And Norton Commons is much more than a development. It's a community. And it's a community of almost 4,000 people and they are very excited to be partners with JCPS. As you can see from all the letters of support and the petitions that the Norton Commons residents and friends of Norton Commons have submitted, um, Norton Commons Elementary fits virtually every single criteria that state law has indicated is appropriate for naming a public school. Uh, the, Norton, the name Norton Commons is a well-known geographic reference. It is certainly development, but it's a community and it's a place, it's a destination, and people know where Norton Commons is. The name also refers to the very notable history of the land and the Norton family, certainly, as we've already discussed, who were community leaders, regional and national philanthropists, and pioneers in uh, radio, broadcasting, and modern agriculture. They did a lot for this area, and I don't think it's too much to, to honor them time and time again. Um, in addition, Norton Commons Elementary referenced the donor of the land that, that made the school possible, certainly as it stands and where it stands today. Um, as somebody noted, there was a land donation of approximately $6 million in value. That's a gift to taxpayers and that's a gift to JCPS as well. And, and that's a fitting um, nod to the donor. Um, finally, Norton Commons, again, as a community, is so excited to have you guys present in our neighborhood. And we really want to contribute to a unique and vibrant school. We want to be good partners, and we want to contribute to the success of the school. And this is a really great way to do that moving forward. Um, one thing in regard to the similar names, we've already mentioned Cochran and Co Cochrane with an E. Uh, there's also 11 other instances of similarly named or identically named schools in the district. These include geographical references, um, names certainly that involve Jefferson. There are at least three of those. And so this has happened. There's significant precedent for this throughout the district, and I don't think that that would be confusing. Um, the name Norton is, is in a lot of places in Louisville. That is true. 
but because of that people have learned to distinguish between Norton Hospital and Norton Brownsboro Hospital and Norton Commons and and things of that nature I think that the people will um, certainly be able to distinguish between the names um, finally of course this is going to serve more than just Norton Commons but so does every school in Jefferson County that has a geographically um, a geographically centered name. Middletown Elementary certainly serves more than, you know, just that cluster right there. Same with J-Town. Same with any school that references a geographical location. I think that the name would be very fitting. The community, community is so excited to have you, and we thank you very much for your consideration. Thank you. Our next speaker is Alan Jones. Alan Jones. <clears throat> You have three minutes, and there will be one I bell after two and a half. Here, I'm say anyway. uh, <laughs> okay, Dr. Hargens, board members, thanks for the opportunity. As a JPCS, uh, JCPS employee for 23 years, and as well as a business owner in Norton Commons, I just want to thank you for the consideration of naming the new school Norton Commons Elementary. I know you've had a ton of support from letters from the community of Norton Commons. My, one of my considerations, I understand, of naming a school is the uh, preference is given to the name by um, the recommendation by the citizens of the school attendees. Um, and we're just really, really excited to have Norton Commons Elementary as the name. It makes sense, it's right in the community. Like Marilyn said, it would be similar to Middletown Elementary, which is right in the heart of Middletown. So I just want to thank you for your time, your consideration, and uh, we're excited to have a school in our community. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, last speaker is Steve Freeman. Mr. Freeman? You also have three minutes with a warning bell at two and a half. Uh, Dr. Hargens, Chairman Jones, board members, uh, my name is Steve Freeman. I'm a CPA. I'm a resident of Norton Commons, and I'm also a business owner. Uh, I've lived there for five years. I've had my business there for three years. And the thing that I, I want to impress upon you, you've gotten all of the information, you've heard all of the arguments, but the thing for me is Norton Commons is not just a developer, it's not just a place, it's a community. If you ever get the opportunity, come out there. I always tell people, we have people out there walking their dogs, themselves, their kids, in anything that'll walk. We have people riding golf carts. We have people that are sitting out on the sidewalks enjoying dinner. And it's a real community. It's a community that people sit on their porches at night. They sit on their back porches at night. And uh, to, to name this school anything other than Norton Commons Elementary would really lose for us the identity of what we've achieved as a community out there. We're a diverse community. We have people of all nationalities, all races. We have young families. We have old families. We have Section 8 housing that's in Norton Commons. We have apartments. We have condos. We have single family homes. And the people that are there, they love it. I'm also a resident elected member of the Homeowners Association. The, myself and another member, we uh, uh, have been out gathering signatures for a petition. I think the petition's been presented to you. We were only able to do this for a couple of hours. In that couple of hours, we obtained 100 signatures in favor of the name Norton Commons Elementary. There was not one person who was opposed to the name Norton Commons Elementary that we spoke to. So it's, it's the, and again, we didn't have enough time to cover the entire neighborhood. But again, I'm asking you, uh, help us to keep our identity as a neighborhood and name this school after the neighborhood, not the developer, not the Norton family, but af after the community that we live in, <coughs> Norton Commons Elementary. Thank you. Thank you very much. 
that concludes our speakers on this agenda item. And uh, now, Dr. Harbins, I would turn to you to introduce your recommendation. Yes, Dr. Raisner, Razor rather, will present the rationale for the recommendation. Good evening once again. You've heard much of the rationale from the uh, supporters behind the name. Basically, what I'd like to do is give you just a quick rundown on the process that was followed. You're familiar with the process of, of naming and the requirements, but uh, suggestions were taken for names for the school. At the conclusion of the suggestion submission period, a community meeting was held at the Norton Commons YMCA over the summer. Uh, during that meeting, the, uh, sorry, I'm getting an echo. During that meeting, a, we're getting double, there we go. During that meeting, a, it was advertised that there would be three finalists determined. And at the conclusion of the meeting, three finalists were determined. And at that time, submissions began coming in to my office, to Dr. Hargan's office, regarding various finalists. The name Norton Commons Elementary met all of the applicable requirements none of the other did, none of the other suggestions did, or to the extent that the name Norton Commons Elementary did, and also as has been stated, preference is given to, per policy, is given to residents of the community in which the, the school or facility is located. Given that, it was the recommendation of this administration to suggest and to recommend that Norton Commons Elementary be the name of the school being built on King's Crown. Okay. <clears throat> Dr. Harbin, do you have anything to add? No, it, it's exactly as Dr. Razor said is the submission of the application fit with the board policy and fit with the requirements <clears throat> of the board policy. Okay. Great. Are there questions? Okay. Um, I have some concerns about this particular issue and the fact that um, I do agree with my former colleague, uh, Debbie Westland, on this particular issue regarding the naming. And I can tell you as an employee of Norton Healthcare, we have patients all the time who show up at one hospital who intentionally meant to go to a different hospital. So they will show up at Norton Audubon when they had meant to go to Norton Women's and uh, Children's or Suburban. Um, so that's actually quite common. And in fact, in this particular instance, I'm aware that of construction crews that have shown up at Norton Elementary, not Norton Commons, wanting to do work. So this confusion is already out there. And these are construction crews with an address, not just a name. Uh, it is confusing that when we have two schools that are so similarly named, such as Cochrane with an E, which uh, is in my district, versus Cochrane without an E, which is not in my district. Um, and we have actually had instances when we've had speakers show up or who are supposed to come to uh, address the board who have shown up at the wrong Cochrane. Um, it happened when we had an Excel award that happened not too long ago. So that's actually another common thing. We also have two Kennedy Elementary schools now, not just in middle school anymore. Um, and this is a concern, and I think it's a real concern. I, I think that we already have honored the memory of George and, uh, and Ms. Norton already with uh, Norton Elementary. Um, I think that the uh, generous donation of the land from Norton Commons is, and the development corporation is great, but as uh, former board member Wesson has said, we've already met that application by you know, building a very nice school out there, and it's a big concern with me. Um, I, I, for that reason, I would recommend that we possibly investigate other uh, names. I know that I understand that Stephen Tyra was the actually preferred name from the meeting that Dr. Razor had talked about earlier, uh, who is an educator with JCPS. Um, if that doesn't meet the criteria and that's the preferred name, it is my recommendation, recommendation that we actually table this and start anew. Uh, simply because having these two facilities this close together, and Norton Commons is the closest elementary to Norton Elementary. It isn't like where Cochrane and Cochrane of Knee are on separate sides of the town. So it is very so is that a motion? <clears throat> yes, I would like to make a motion. motion to, I would like to make a motion to table this, uh, the naming of this particular school to another time. Okay, is there a second? 
There is no second. Okay. Is there an alternative motion? Steph? Um, I make the motion to name the school of Norton Commons Elementary. Okay, is there a second? Okay, Linda? I'll second that. Okay, all in favor? Opposed? Okay, motion carries six to one. Thank you. Okay. <coughs> Next item is the approval of boundaries for the Norton Commons Elementary School. Dr. Hargens. I'll just remind you that in June, we pre uh, Dr. Dossett presented boundaries uh, for uh, this school. And then two weeks ago, we presented four different options and pros and cons about the options. It was a work session and it was an information item. Uh, tonight, uh, Dr. Dossett is going to present to you uh, the recommendation based on, on that analysis. Dr. Dossett. So tonight we're bringing forward the recommendation to go with option two, which is to take the boundary for the new elementary school um, from the Chansey boundary that currently exists. Um, students, elementary students will be applying for elementary schools for 1617 next month. And so um, we would like to move forward on having the boundaries, um, th these proposed boundaries approved. Uh, in the meetings in the spring, we didn't hear any parent concerns around this part particular proposed boundary. It provides extra space to grow in cluster 10, and it's the least disruptive um, of the four options that we presented at the last board work session. Um, now, I understand that um, we have heard some concerns around that diversity of this proposed boundary and this cluster in general. And so just to remind everybody um, how we define diversity, for, that ca for this area, it's considered a category two. That was um, based on the 2010 census data where we look at income, educational attainment, and minority status of the census data. Um, we know that we've had some changes in that area since 2010, and so it was important for us to look to see the student population that lives within that proposed boundary um, from 2015. And when we look at the students that are currently residing in that area, 48% of those students um, are minority students, and we've seen an increase from 2010 to 2015 in the percentage of students on free and reduced lunch from 13% to 19%. So we're seeing that same growth as um, the district as a whole. So um, the other piece that I want to mention is that, that to express that we're committed to revisiting the idea of diversity and um, looking closer at how we, how we de define diversity in our student assignment plan when we get the new census data or at the time that grandfathering um, finishes, which is in two years, 1718. And so at that time, I think it'll be important for us to take a look at the system overall and recommit to diversity and how we define that. But for the short, short term and for um, next month having boundaries for students to um, apply to the school, um, staff is recommending that we move forward on this um, proposed boundary. Uh, which again is the least disruptive and allows for some future growth. Okay, thank you. Are there questions? Diane? Just, just want to make a few comments. Um, thank you, Dina, for your presentation. And I would like to go back and highlight what you said about 2010 census data. Um, the points I want to make will reflect my concerns and um, I will vote to move this forward because we must, but there are some things that concern me greatly. Uh, the census data in 2010 made the, uh, that geographic area a two. Clearly we know that's not a two at this time based on the housing that is in that area. So I think in all fairness to our population that we should say exactly that and that we, and you did say that we would work on it in 2020. The other piece that we had discussed as a board was in two years we would no longer be grandfathering, but we run the potential of starting to grandfather again as we move forward with this 
uh, in 2020, perhaps. So as, as we say, speak the truth and be transparent, I just want to say all the things that have made me think about this in depth. And the other piece that concerns me is the monitoring of the diversity index, which I'm not even going to go into the dynamics of that, because somebody today said, what is that? So I just want to be clear that looking at the diversity index for cluster 10 currently, it runs as low as a 1.6 for one school and as high as a 2.8 for another school. And I, I remain concerned as to how we will have a diverse school in that particular location. But it's not, as I was, it was clear to me today, it's not my, my job to look at that on a daily basis, but it is my job to say to the management that someone needs to watch and to let the board know clearly what the diversity index is in this particular and all the locations in the district because I am concerned, remain concerned, but we have to move forward with what we're going to do in order to start the enrollment for the elementary process. But those are the, the concerns that I have. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Lisa? Um, I have similar concerns to those that Ms. Porter raised. Um, you know, I just believe that public uh, schools are a rising tide that should lift all boats. And when we look at any of the demographic maps for our district, we see lots and lots of green, you know, which is the happy color um, on the eastern half of the county. And we see lots and lots of red and orange in the area that I have been elected to represent. We see it in kindergarten readiness. We see it in educational <coughs> attainment of parents. We see it uh, in uh, socioeconomic status. We see it in a number of different ways. And um, you know, this isn't really a problem that JCPS created. It's not really a situation that JCPS can by itself fix, although I do wonder if it might not be a wake-up call to all of us to uh, be advocating for greater economic investment in some of our more challenged communities, parts of town, um, and for more affordable housing across the county. Um, so I, I've really wrestled with this. Um, it's, it's uh, you know, one of those issues that's kept me awake nights. Uh, and while I'm not going to stand in the way of, uh, I'm not going to vote against it, but I'm not going to be able to vote for it either for the reasons that I've explained. Other comments? Okay, I have a couple. Um, I think the, um, the, challenge of the data is, um, I think, kind of acute here in the context of our assignment plan because, um, Dr. Dossett, correct me if I'm wrong, but um, when you describe the student data, you're talking about the students currently enrolled in JCPS who, are, who reside in this locale, right? Correct. Right. Yes. So um, <clears throat> this is an area that between 2010 and today has built a really, really wonderful, beautiful neighborhood. Um, with houses that are priced far above the average in the district, and it also has opened a spectacularly beautiful, beautiful parochial school um, right down the block from um, this new elementary <laughs> school. So if you actually look at the humans who are probably there today and will be in the 2020 census data, it's, I think part of the challenge here is it, it, it's not a it's not a bad thing. Um, I think we're going to have a beautiful school, and it will be very, very attractive to an awful lot of people. And that's a part of the county where the population is growing very fast. And you know, public schools are for everybody. So, um, but I just I think we're all kind of wrestling with, gee, in 2020 when we get that census data, or whoever is sitting here is going to look at it, and um, it's going to look pretty different. And the um, the challenge of making sure that um, you know, this beautiful school and this beautiful neighborhood um, meets the, you know, the values of um, diversity and access um, to people who don't live right next door to it um, is going to be a bigger one uh, probably going forward. So um, with that comment, um, I'm prepared to, I guess I'll invite a motion to um, approve the boundary lines. Steph moves it. Is there a second? I'll second. Okay, Linda seconds. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Abstaining. 
Okay, 601. All right, thank you very much. And we are done with that. The next item is an information item, which is an update on the draft strategic plan. We have two speakers on this item. Uh, before uh, Dr. Hargens, I turn it over to you. The first is Tom Moffat. Mr. Tom Moffat, would you come up? And you have spoken to us before. You know the rules. Thank you. <coughs> okay, you may begin. Uh, Dr. Hargens and board members, Vision 2020 still needs to include a much stronger statement of priority for reducing the achievement gaps for the four underperforming groups that continue to make up three quarters of the students of JCPS. It's not enough for all students to improve if most of them will be falling continually behind and therefore get locked into, if not failure, near failure in their future <clears throat> lives. And then made to feel that it's their own fault. <laughs> These gaps remain essentially unchanged in spite of decades of effort by JCPS to achieve equity emphasized in Vision 2015, we've been trying, we say. Actually, in 2014, those gaps increased. And again, as near as I can tell, in 2015. I just again have to say, that is not, that's a crime that we, all of us are sitting here and allowing to happen in our name. It's not just you board members, it's the community that's allowing this to happen. We must, all of us, take responsibility. We must set a goal for positive change and tw Vision 2020 is the place to do it. Narrow the gaps each year. That needs to be our highest priority. For 40 years we've been measuring these gaps, trying all kinds of innovative and pilot programs, getting no measurable change. The students who start out ahead and whose parents have the time and money to make sure they succeed still gets the highest priority year after year. Evidently, we haven't done what it takes. Let me get personal. Three generations of my family have been or are now in that privileged group that gets along fine. But the future for my great-grandson depends not on that group, it depends on the rest of us. Narrow the gaps by 1% at least each year, beginning in 2016, concentrate on moving students from novice to apprentice. Identify changes that work. Do the things that we already know are working. Do them heavily, hard, and get it done. Thank you, Mr. Moffat. Next speaker is Kanisha Fisher. Ms. Fisher, thank you for being with us tonight. You have three minutes. One bell rings at the end of two and a half and two at the end of three. Perfect, thank you very you much for having me. when ready. I appreciate it. Um, board and parents here, first of all, thank you all for allowing me to speak this evening. I have three points that you have the power to change. And I know that we all are on the same page with that. My name is Kenesha Fisher. I'm the mother of five boys in JCPS. So this does involve my children, even though they are of the percentage that the gentleman sp spoke of, that they will be just fine. However, first, third grade reading promise. It, was in vision, it is in Vision 2020, however, it was in Vision 2015. That means we should be reaching this goal now. 
Third grade reading scores help to determine the quantity of prison cells to be built in America. You could provide summer bridge programs, tutoring, anything that child needs before we pass them on to the fourth grade. No exceptions. This should be identified at the beginning of third grade so as to make the most progress possible toward this goal by the end of the school year. By passing a child who cannot read, at least to their level, in the fourth grade, you are saying that I know there is a prison cell being created for you and I'm fine with that. And that's something we cannot have. Reevaluate boundary maps is the second. Listening to Norton Commons is one of the biggest problems I have. In an already largely segregated city, that is not your fault. It has genuinely been here since my, my mother's mother was here. The problem is, I understand why busing is crucial. I do. I also understand by you correcting these maps to represent a more even dispersion across the district, it will encourage community pride, parent involvement, after school enrichment will be more accessible, kids will spend less time on buses that no one wants to drive. Charter schools are not the answer, but neither are 65 kids on a bus from the West End to a predominantly white school in the East End. Parents that have no or limited transportation or feel alienated by their socioeconomic status are being strategically pushed out of an opportunity to be involved in their kids' education. I've been meeting with Dear JCPS and understanding my rights as a parent, and I really want to work with you, but I can't work under these measures. Third, rebrand the priority schools, the Title I schools, to not be based on stereotypes but on results. If they're making results, they need to be rewarded for that. When I say names like Shawnee, PRP, Valley, and Doss, I know what those have meant as I grew up in Louisville, but they should have the ability to have the same weight as me saying Manual, Male, Eastern, Ballard, like all those students you had standing up here tonight. That should be a regular for everyone to have that, that choice. Showcase of schools should be just that, a showcase of all schools, not an opportunity for your top performers to garnish more entrance to their cherry picking systems. The truth of the matter is these schools should be treated with the utmost respect, superior involvement and priority, not as disposable to fill our bottom 5%. I charge you as people who are crucial in the education of our city's next generation to ask yourself what exactly is your role and how can I get parents involved? Because the mindset is what needs to change. More importantly, as a parent, how will my requests be addressed? How can I know that you all are going to be involved in my five children's education? Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Dr. Hargens. What Mr. Lowe is gonna do is give an overview of the process, just a quick update about Vision 2020. Um, so uh, d I handed out a, a, a sheet of paper that uh, you had received uh, this past week that just kind of lays out sort of the timeline of, of where, we, where we are and where we're going. Um, at uh, the board meeting on um, Monday, October 12th, you all provided uh, feedback to initial, uh, the initial draft of Vision 2020. Um, and it, moving almost immediately from there, we embarked on a series of meetings with stakeholder groups, including the Jefferson County Teachers Association, the Jefferson County Association of School Administrators, the 15th District PTA, um, a set of um, academic services uh, staff members, which are assistant superintendents, ETCs, and curriculum specialists. And we spoke to the Principals Communication Committee, which probably has uh, 20 or 25 uh, principals on it. And we also have received a number of um, uh, uh, community members who have submitted things online. And so we've aggregated all of that information and uh, are, are planning to actually share that online. Uh, I was hoping for that to happen today. It's actually gonna happen tomorrow morning just because I wanted to clean it up a little bit. But we've had over 350 different comments that, uh, that um, show up. Some of them, you know, multiple times, as you can imagine in such a structure, um, themes emerge, patterns, and those kinds of things. Um, what I can tell you is uh, that's going to um, enrich uh, the, the next iteration of this without changing the basis of it. You know, the basis of it comes from your direction and your guidance about what you see is most important. But there were um, really valuable um, pieces of language or um, areas of emphasis that, that will, will make the, the, the final product um, I think um, markedly better. So we're in the um, in the midst of pulling all that all together and coming to the next um, piece. We've put put together a team of JCPS staff that includes people from our communications office, resource development, and, um, and the planning departments um, that have you know significant and diverse kinds of talents, both in sort of thinking about policy 
and, um, and structures, but also language and framing and, and organization. So um, we're taking all the information that we have and moving forward um, to you know, bring forward to you in the <coughs> next iteration um, the, next, the next iteration. Uh, so the, the plan is to uh, work very, very hard on that for the next four or five days, uh, share that with Dr. Hargens and Cabinet for another sort of internal version, and share that with you the subsequent week um, so that you have a good chunk of time prior to the um, November 9th meeting uh, where we'll have a work session for discussion and conversation. And ultimately, um, the recommendation for approval would come on November 23rd. So that's a little bit longer, but I think um, ultimately it will bring, be a, um, a better product for it. Okay, are there questions for Jonathan? Well, uh, just, just one, Jonathan. I think uh, there are several areas that I saw in here before, and I think we, I went through a few of them. We all named a few of those things. Have you um, been able to process those and, and be able to make changes or anything based on any of that input that we gave you last Yes, I, the, 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 the input that you shared on, on October 12th um, was invaluable, and, um, and it's my hope and belief that you'll be able to see in the guidance that you gave at that point in in the next version of it. Okay, very good. Lisa? Yeah, I'll just ask for a little preview. Um, since equitable outcomes was in the original work group report and then you've asked about it again and we continue to hear speakers raising these issues, so I assume we're going to see that reflected in the yes, next iteration? Yes, we're, work, we're working on targets that will Great. capture um, some of the things that we've already been tracking from Vision 2015, but then augmenting that with additional um, measures that will capture that concern. Thank you, Jonathan. Okay. All right, so I think for the board's purpose, the, um, <coughs> the main news tonight is that the vote has been kicked back two weeks to um, November 23rd, and there will be another work session on November 9th um, where we will have a chance to discuss all of this. I mean, basically, Jonathan and the team's mission is to take hundreds of pages of comments, <coughs> put them all in there, and shorten the document so it's clearer and more concise, <laughs> right? <laughs> it's a piece of cake. No. Right. It's kind of like if you had more time, it would have been shorter, right? So um, anyway, um, but we do have um, you know, another iteration coming, and that's the timetable that we're working off of. So um, let's see. Thank you, and I believe we're supposed to vote now to approve the fact that we have received this update. So, so moved, second by Ms. Duncan. All in favor, aye. Thank you very much. Um, next, we have a review of the 2016 legislative agenda, and um, we have a piece of paper that's been handed to us. Um, so, Donna, you want to introduce that? Yes. Actually, this is a revised uh, legislative agenda based on some feedback, and I'll let Jonathan go through right. the feedback. So, the second page that you have, which is version 7, um, actually shows um, proposed changes from 20 uh, from the October 12th meeting to today um, and that was sort of what was shared with you prior to the board meeting um, over the weekend there were some comments that that I thought um, were um, pertinent and so the the top page is actually what what we're bringing forward right now um, it's essentially exactly the same in content with what you had seen previously it just reorganizes things a little bit on, under the the first bullet of providing increased funding for elementary and secondary <coughs> education. Essentially what it does is it organizes things so that all of the grant funding is sort of put in one bucket, one bullet point. Um, so gifted and talented <coughs> funds and fund to support at-risk students who have experienced trauma, which the board members um, had suggested be added, <coughs> are, are in that sort of uh, grant bucket. Um, so it's just a, an organizational thing. And then the second, um, area where there was a change, and this is all highlighted in yellow, um, is, is language around um, superintendent authority to select principals. 
And essentially what it's, the focus is to um, express support for working in collaborations with stakeholders and legislators to find um, um, a solution where we can um, get the superintendent more greater authority in the selection of a principal um, while also making sure that input from teachers, parents, and staff, and community members um, is taken into account. Other okay. than that, it's the same that you had seen at the, the last. All right, and I believe the timetable on this is two weeks from tonight we'll be asked to vote right. on uh, at least version. that's the current assumption. So, yes. board members, are there questions, comments here? Chuck? Yeah, and uh, Chair Jones, I, I, I don't know if this should be directed. Well, I think it should probably be directed to my peers more than Jonathan, but uh, Jonathan, feel free to chime in. Um, on the superintendent authority, um, is this what was your understanding that was communicated uh, as our, uh, of what we wanted as a board? Because I'm not in, in favor of full authority over all schools. Um, I think there should be a hybrid there. And the reason why I'm not in full authority of the superintendent naming every principal in Jefferson County Public Schools it's not, a, it's not a statement on the superintendent's capability, but what I have not been assured is that um, stakeholder input is not minimized here um, and not paid lip service. Um, it says they would be informed by input received from teachers, parents, staff, and community members. My fear is there might be a forum where they say, hey, here's what we think, and then we go on and do what we want to do because the superintendent had somebody and that's my fear and that's my hesitation to accept this. But I, I really would like to hear from, the, if we have an opportunity for sure. some discussion, to hear from uh, other board members, peers on the board. Okay. Chris and then uh, Lisa. Um, <laughs> actually, I share a part of that concern. I, I think that, you know, when we originally, and, I proposed this legislation last year. It was for a very select group of schools. I believe it was the last 20% of schools, uh, and if you're in the last 20% of schools within the state, then we were looking at trying to make a change before, I guess the analogy was uh, made, before the train went off the rails. It's, uh, right now, law gives us the ability to make a change after it's gone off the rails, but we were trying to do this beforehand. And I think for schools that, you know, as much as I talk about SBDMs, and in, in particular this issue, there are schools that have very good SBDMs and they're, you know, they're performing just fine. Um, you know, my focus on this particular piece of legislation has always been for a specific set of schools that we can write the train before we have an issue. Uh, furthermore, I, I'm actually on the other side of this, looking at how we strike out some of, the, some of these items, it is because we make it more broad as a legislator who has, you know, is concerned about a myriad of different things across the state, my concern is that that legislature now doesn't really have a good idea uh, or focus that we're giving them of what we specifically would like done. Uh, it's, it's, to me, it's too broad, and it, it, it invites a lot of interpretation into what we may or may not want because this is so broad. So I'm more in favor of having it more targeted and I like that original, um, you know, the, the original um, uh, verbiage in here a little bit better. So that's my comments. Okay. Lisa? Mine was actually on a different bullet point. So. Okay. Well, let's finish up this one. Any, Steph? Um, yeah. I just, being a former SBDM member, I just wanted to get the understanding, Jonathan, why the language, like why what was the rationale for taking out the language? Was it strategic? Was it like what's... So my, my sense of this is that um, there's, that it, it's an expression of a commitment to work with our stakeholder partners to find um, common language and common ground where we can come together and bring something together to right. the General Assembly saying, you know, JCPS is looking for this, other stakeholders other key uh, organizations are, are on board. That becomes a much easier kind of um, sell to a legislator that, that's you know weighing the different voices that they're hearing. So uh, my sense of it is, you know, this is only as good as what gets developed in that process with our with our with our 
um, collaborators. So um, are we um, within Jefferson County? Has this language been collaborated so that as a Jefferson County group, the people coming, whether it be from schools or you know different groups, there were several that went to Frankfurt. And do we have some kind of consensus on this language <coughs> with internally within Jefferson County, so we're going with one voice to Frankfurt? Or is this just leaving open the door to have that discussion in Frankfurt? So I think, well, yeah, let, let, me, um, let me comment a little bit on this. I think there, are, um, I think um, consensus would be too strong a word, but I think Jonathan's point um, was the main point, which is the revision of the language here is <coughs> meant to take a more general position so that um, this board is saying basically we, you know, we support um, an enhancement of the central authority over um, naming of principles, but we want to work together with legislators, which means not only, certainly including the Jefferson County delegation, but not only, we want to address the reality that sometimes if JCPS goes in and asks for something, it will create kind of a bow wave <coughs> and get the opposite reaction. Um, and also have other stakeholders so that it's not, you know, again, a central office against the, um, you know, against the schools and the SBDM kind of dynamic. Um, I know certainly the um, Greater Louisville Inc. Um, legislative folks are working um, on this. I don't think anybody has a legislative package that has consensus right now, but um, Part of the notion is if you try to say the bottom 25% or the bottom 50%, there are a whole lot of other scenarios like, um, for example, scenarios where principals have to be dismissed as we've seen for you know, difficulties that you know, have arisen or where there's, um, you know, God forbid, a tragic accident or an illness or something like that where time is of the essence. And so, those have been the kind of conversations that have been going on. And I think the idea here is for the board to say, work the issue with the people who are um, playing on it. Because there's no, um, I, mean, I think there's no desire to abandon SBDMs, but there's also recognition that um, building a pipeline of strong principles is super important. That's, that'd be my summary. Jonathan, you want to add to that, or? Can Go I ahead, finish? Dis yeah. Yeah. In the spirit of discussion, Chair yeah. Jones, I'll, I'll respond. Um, I, um, I I get I get that, and I understand when you go to the legislature, you want there's some give and take, there's some conversation that'll be held. You also find out where the landmines are, what the success is, where where what the pathway is to uh, get where you want to go, and there's compromise. I get that. I understand and um, support a the mentality of the super as a CEO kind of of an organization as well, and appointing managers in her place. Um, all I need for help for me is to understand that the stakeholders, and you kind of summed it up a little bit, Mr. Jones, the super, that the stakeholders um, do have a voice. If we take a vote from them, their voice has weakened some. But I want to make sure that they're involved in it as well. Um, so my advice is uh, maybe some uh, baby steps there, but I just need for me I need to understand more that we're, if we present this and looking for more flexibility, as you're saying, Mr. Jones, then we are also, uh, the dual message is that we are making sure that our parents and our teachers are actively engaged with some input. Thank you. Okay. Linda? Well, I never have been a big fan of, of that full authority for the the superintendent, not just this superintendent, but past superintendents uh, to have had uh, some of that because I, as a, a person out in the schools, I never felt that the superintendent knew the personnel as well as I thought uh, that they needed to know personnel to make some of those decisions. And, you know, I, I just keep thinking when we go up there and when we, we begin to talk about this authority, they're going to look at us and our 20 priority schools and, and they're going to say, okay, you've had, the superintendents have had that authority, 
and where are they? We have one priority school that's come out of priority status. So I, I think, you know, that's, that's what I'm feeling when this goes there. I don't know how much steam it's going to have behind it because we have that uh, on our backs with uh, the challenges that we have in our priority schools. Um, I, I just, I've never been comfortable with this and um, I don't know if, if there's a way that this can even be worded. I mean, we've, we've stepped back away from, from the specific ranking kind of thing to lower performing. Well, lower performing means something different than out to, to others out in the state. Of course, if this is just directed at us, you know, who's defining lower performing? Uh, if you're performing below uh, other schools in this system, you can be lower performing. So um, I, I've, I've always been uncomfortable with this. And, I, you know, I just want us to think about this before we okay. do this. So this will come back to a work session in two weeks, but I want to be really clear. Um, I think it is a sense of the clear majority of this board that um, this district must build a human resource capability to identify, train, groom, a pipeline of principals to lead our schools and to deal with what we heard. I mean, what was the common characteristic from the work session this afternoon? We need a human resources capability that will fill the pipeline with teachers before October 15th or whenever the, actually we haven't even filled all the positions yet this year, right? I mean, that's the common denominator is that we have got to put the gas down in the reorganization and improvement of HR and, um, some additional authority over the pipeline. I mean, I may, you guys tell me if I'm wrong, but I think we're talking about how do we get it um, out of the legislature, not do we try. Am I, I mean, am I right about that? I, I mean. Well, I would think that we just need to get somebody in HR. Well, That's the first thing. <clears throat> That's an important thing. For yeah. sure. I mean, I, yeah. so we have to clean our house first before we go to the legislature about HR. That's, no, my, that's I my concern. Believe, I mean, big organizations have to do many different things all at the same time. And I agree we have to do what you suggest, but legislative change takes a long time. So, Diane? I just want to quickly go back and review um, my, my thoughts as to why I think this is important is that whenever a person is hired or selected to be someone and we go back to uh, if there's a, a question, if we have a question about any principalship, we go to the superintendent. And I agree that there should be input, people should be heard, but when we have a question about something that's going on in a school, we go directly to the superintendent. And she is the one, or he is the one that is held accountable. Um, in going to conferences and in talking with folks, and I realize that we're probably the only state that has something like SBDM, the question becomes when you ask other districts, you know, who appoints your principals, the answer is the superintendent. So the question becomes how do we have strategically input from everyone involved, but the bottom line, if there's a problem with the principal, it goes back to the superintendent. And low performing, middle performing, no performing, it goes back to the superintendent. So I don't want us to lose the concept of who right. is who we personally hold responsible right. if there's a problem. And I think that's how some of this conversation started. But if there's, if I were to go back to the SBDM committee, in some cases, they're not even there anymore. Those people have moved on. So how do we go back and talk, have a conversation about how did you come to this? And currently, I think the way, if I'm understanding correctly, if the recommendation is made to the superintendent, the, she can not, he or she cannot change it unless there's some cause to not take that recommendation. And the, it seems that this is not an efficient or effective way for us to hire principals. So uh, those are my thoughts. Don't have to put it in words. I don't know how to put it in words. But ultimately, somebody one person typically is responsible. And in this case, for this school system, our school systems in other parts of the United States, it's the superintendent. So what do we need to do to get stakeholder input, <coughs> but give the authority and the responsibility uh, to the superintendent? Those are my thoughts. 
Okay, great. So this comes back in two weeks. I have a, a different bullet point. You do. Now it's your turn. Thank you. Uh, this is actually the first one, provide increased funding for elementary and secondary education. And it's a language thing, but and it's the third bullet point uh, where we've added and funds to support at-risk students who have experienced trauma. Um, so my, uh, obviously the spirit of it I support. Um, I think at risk is one of those murky and sort of vaguely pejorative terms um, that we apply to certain groups of students. Um, and trauma is kind of a catch-all and means different things to different people. So I would uh, just request that we use adverse childhood experiences, which actually has research and we can look up what that means and what those are. So to support students who have experienced adverse childhood experiences or other barriers to learning as being maybe a little more respectful and um, clear. Okay, thank you. All right. So there is no action um, to be taken on this, but we just need to vote to receive a review of the draft agenda, which we just have. Is there such a motion? Steph moves, Linda seconds, all in favor, aye passes unanimously. <coughs> Next we are on to the consent calendar. Um, would any board member like to pull down any consent calendar items for further discussion? Chris. I'd like to uh, pull down item P5. P5. P as in Paul. And item T, T as in Tom. Linda? Um, I'd like to, to say something about I, well, you said I, and S. About what? Uh, uh, I, you said I. I, didn't you? No, I said, no, I did not. I said P5. Oh, okay. Um, I and S. I and F is in Frank? S. S is in Susan. Snitch. Okay. Um, any others? Okay, we'll go in, oh, I'm sorry, we have a, we have a speaker on a consent calendar item, sorry about that. Um, on Q2, why don't we ask Ms. Linda Scherer to come forward and speak on Q2, <coughs> Ms. Scherer. Approval of agreement with Shawnee Christian Healthcare Center, Inc. for provision of school-based health services at the Academy of Shawnee. You have three minutes, a bell will ring after two and a half and then two bells at three. I'm here to express my concerns about a public school related health service associated with one specific religion. While it certainly appears to be a generous grant from Southeast Christian Church to finance a health care clinic at the Academy at Shawnee, the choice of vendor must be carefully vetted to ensure the separation of church and state is guaranteed by our Constitution. I've done a preliminary review of the requirements for employment by Shawnee Christian Healthcare. There are several statements that cause me concern. First, every employee is required to sign that they are in agreement with SCHC Statement of Faith. Second, each employee must agree to support their mission, which is, and I quote, sharing the love of Christ in word and deed. And third, their stated reason for existence is, and again I quote, to care for the self-worth of every individual, helping them to recognize they are made in God's image, end quote. That would, of course, be the image of the Christian God as defined by Southeast Christian and SCHC. <clears throat> also of concern, according to the contract posted online, JCPS shall not have any control or direction over the <clears throat> manner, methods, or means by which JCHC performs its work and functions. I would like to point out that not every student at the Academy of Shawnee is of the same Christian denomination or is Christian. I'm concerned that these students personal beliefs could be overlooked. The need for a school nurse at the Academy of Shawnee is well recognized by the staff. If the board also recognizes this need, it seems to me that it would be a priority, not only for the Academy at Shawnee, but also for other schools, certainly those with high rates of free and reduced lunches. Such services can be provided without religious involvement by using the health services office we already have within JCPS. That office contracts with Career Staff Unlimited to supply additional nurses to our schools. 
If the board is unable to find the resources to fund such a need, perhaps that grant from Southeast Christian <clears throat> could be given to the health services office to supply staffing to the academy at Shawnee. It seems to me that this solution would be a win for all the students at the academy, not just the ones who identify as Christian. This would ensure that the nurses in the schools are committed to cultural diversity and address students' needs without invoking a specific religious tradition. While such an agreement would of necessity have to be checked out by legal, if there are no strings attached to such a gift, it may well avoid being considered an illegal mixing of specific religion with tax-supported public school education. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Um, and I'm going to pull down Q2, the one that was just referenced, mm -hmm. also for discussion. So um, let's now take them in order. Um, Linda, on item I, approval of competitive negotiation, et cetera. Yes, and um, I really just want to comment on this. I, I'm, I'm going to support this. Uh, I know that we're, <coughs> we're using, uh, or we're going to use a, a firm for hiring uh, some of the uh, try and seek candidates for the positions that we have open, but um, this is not my first choice, and I feel it's an admission that we have not, uh, we don't have the usual structure in place, the usual capacity that we have to do our own hiring, and uh, so, but I'm, I'm just, I, I want these positions filled, and if this will expedite that, then I'm willing to do that, but I, I certainly hope that we don't have to do this again. Okay, thank you. Uh, Chris P5. Uh, yes, I'd like to, uh, if we can get just a little bit more information about this project. I've talked to Dr. Razor about it, and I wonder if you might be able to speak to it a little bit, and I do have some questions on the, at the end. Yes, uh, Trees Louisville is a, I'm on, aren't I? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Trees I Louisville so. is a local nonprofit company, <laughs> 501c3, that is uh, really trying to fight the urban heat island in, that is uh, occurring within Jefferson County and being one of the largest landowners in the county they approached JCPS about really dramatically changing the uh, appearance and the landscape of some of our properties and what we're talking about here is not the donation of one or two trees at a time that many times we get in uh, within JCPS we're literally talking about in some cases, 100, 200 trees on a property, taking what would be vacant areas or areas that are simply grassy areas in front of the schools. For example, saw a mock-up last week of Doss High School, and if you've been to Doss High School, you, you drive up in front of it and there's literally a football field size area in front of the school. They have plans to put a hundred tree grove in front of the school and when you see the mock-ups completely changes the appearance of what would be a really industrial soviet era somewhat looking looking structure that stands alone by itself that we completely change the landscape of they have done mock-ups of five buildings now we've they've also been in contact with a with a nursery that has went out of business and basically has gotten the entire stock of those trees and then has received funding from the Helmsley Foundation of several hundred thousand dollars to continue the projects and literally see or really see this as something that sort of has, has a flywheel potential as they get more donations more donations will come in uh, they are going to locate acquire plant and then all we have to do is maintain the trees, which they will help us with in the beginning. And we've put the infrastructure in place as we get the donations. The other things that we are doing is looking to scale this in a doable model where we don't get 12,000 trees in one year and can't maintain them all. So we're really looking at maybe three or four sites per year to start off to make sure that we can maintain the capacity for this. When we, do, so when we start this project and as it grows into fruition, um, do we have anyone internal on staff who is, can, I know the city has two arborists on staff, uh, do we have anyone like that on our, on our end for our infrastructure? We, we do not have an, 
Arborist, we do have a uh, manager of grounds, and then we also do have someone who does landscape uh, architecture for us on small scale. However, Trees Louisville does have arborists who work mm -hmm. for them that can consult with us, and the trees that are being picked out are also native to Louisville, native to Kentucky, and one of the other things that we're looking at too is as we can put in these these trees that are native to Louisville and also long lasting trees, perhaps removing some of the smaller shrub trees that we have that will die off, that will leave holes in our in our landscape into the future. Okay. Um, Chuck has a question about this too. Okay. So, so to wrap up, um, so my question, your right, uh, concern actually is that I think this is a great program. I, I'm really glad that the district is trying to do something to address the heat island. Um, you know, this is a, a, you know, a very big concern. But I also want to say that, you know, I was speaking with leadership over at Bernheim Forest as of last night, and I, I expressed a concern I had about one incident that was publicized a bit on Twitter, that fact that we had removed the tree because it had interfered with light or, cam or the camera angle of, uh, for a particular school. And my concern is that, we, I would like us to at least get into the point where we're going to uh, look and consult with maybe Trees Louisville about other areas if we can. I know that the leadership over uh, Bernheim had suggested that there's a number of organizations such as Trees Louisville that can work pretty much for free with us if we ask for their advice. But in this particular case, I'd like us to you know try and get to a point where we're actually, if we tear down, we cut down a tree, at least we replace it with maybe three more just to make sure that we do have some type of coverage for that and we practice what we preach. Absolutely. Thank you. Okay. Chuck. Yeah, I think you actually answered it. I would I would add on to that. We have a uh, fantastic forestry department with the Metro Parks and Recreation mm -hmm. here. A uh, very skilled uh, group of people there that probably mm -hmm. could help and uh, be a, a good partner in this. But I think you answered. Just like our state forestry department only gives native trees, these will be native trees to Louisville or Kentucky? These will be uh, native trees to the area. And we're also working in conjunction with Metro. Metro Louisville is also a huge landowner, obviously, within the, uh, within the uh, county. And we're working with them. We, we sat down with the Helmsley Foundation representatives from JCPS and from Metro Louisville, letting them know our commitment if they could secure these donations to uh, move forward. OK, thank you. Um, next on Q2. Oh, just um, one, one more question on that. Uh, this is, I got to remind people, this is a consent agenda item. Yes, Go ahead, but yes. let's wrap this up and move. Uh, Dr. Razor, uh, will, who will be responsible for replacing if these trees don't make it? Is, is that just going to be, we're going to put them out there and, and uh, the, only the fit survive, or, or are we going to, to have a plan in place where we then commit to replacing? Well, we are going to have a plan that where we would commit to replace trees, but Trees Louisville is going to work with us from the very beginning. And we do know when you do any sort of mass planting, you will have some, uh, some attrition rates. But as we move forward, that's also, again, why we're not going to do 12,000 at one time, where we can do it, see which ones have lived, and then the next year backfill, if possible, before we move forward on to other locations. Okay, okay thank you. Um, on Q2, the previous speaker raised fair questions about church and state. Dr. Harding, is someone here who can answer the question whether that has already been reviewed and vetted? Yeah, from a Ms. Legal Dennis actually is the area superintendent for okay. the academy at Shawnee. Right. The question is just do those fit with traditional church state separation guidelines? Sorry? Yes. Mr. Mellon reviewed okay. it as well. All right, Correct. Great. So we specifically spoke to these these folks and told them, reminded them of the rules about separation of church and state, and they completely understood that and agreed there'd be no sort of proselytizing or anything along those lines. Um, and also, we we of course sent the contract to Mr. Mellon to review ahead of time. Okay. Is it is it legitimate separated? Uh, yes, they're required by the contract to uh, follow JCPS policy and procedure. The uh, language that was quoted uh, is standard independent contractor language that's in all contracts to ensure that the contracting party is an independent contractor, not an employee or partner or other type of relationship. Uh, so there's nothing unusual about that language. Okay, so this is the equivalent of Jewish Hospital or Norton Hospital running a clinic for us? Uh, y yes, the district has contracts, for example, with Catholic Baptist. charities that uh, yeah. uh, are similar. Okay. 
Thank you. Thank you. All right, um, Linda S. Oh, just a, a you know, Head Start in uh, preschool require different things of their teachers. And I notice in this one, we are going to try and utilize our preschool teachers in to serve more Head Start uh, students, or it appear to be that way to me. Is there a reason why we have not done this before, or why, or is there something that's popped up different? Because we've kept those programs separate. Is there a reason why we have we been given freedom to do something now Mr. that Jones. we couldn't do? Jones. Thanks for the question. We appreciate that. Um, first, we're we're sort of moving to a. Do I should I tell who I am? <laughs> <laughs> we're moving to. Uh, Ms. Duncan, a, a, what we call a blended model. And blended model means that we're really uh, strategically making a decision that no longer will, in JCPS, we'll be able to determine a Head Start classroom and a preschool classroom. Blended means we're going to expand the footprint from north to south, east to west, and one classroom may have five children that qualify for Head Start under their guidelines, and they may have 10 students that qualify under Kentucky preschool guidelines and may have five that qualify under ECE guidelines. But as far as the general public goes, that is a early childhood classroom point blank period. And we will get funding from different sources for each child. We have to rise to the higher standard. In Kentucky, they require in our preschool program a certified teacher in preschool classrooms. So when we move from from straight Head Start preschool classrooms, we must have a higher standard, which means our Head Start students will be taught by a certified teacher, but it's a program that will go over a five-year period. It'll take us five years to get there. Okay, let me, let me interrupt. Um, Sorry. This is a very broad subject. We are going to come back to early childhood with um, work sessions and great detail. The only question tonight is whether we can bid on the Head Start contract um, so Diane do you have a that was my uh, it's on my list of things that I'm asking for under yeah. board requests because this is the signing of the contract but there's more information to be heard but I, I would like to under board request say more thank yeah. you I mean I think we would like to get this scheduled for a real review but we've got to go ahead and meet the head start deadline and we've got to get um, early childhood gavel down into the strategy as something that we're going to do and then we got to come back in a you know more full-throated way and really look at the um, at the how to do it so is that well I, I was just wondering why we haven't done this before if well, something new had happened it's not anything new other districts have done it uh, for a long period of time we J JCPS for whatever uh, has not made that decision but with this we, we hope that we do Okay. All right. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Chris T. Uh, yes, I have several concerns about this issue. Uh, first of all, the this particular schedule of moving the board meetings to Tuesday as opposed to the traditional Monday that they've been for years and years and years uh, presents an issue because, one, as I look at this proposed schedule, it actually eliminates a board meeting. Normally, we meet 21 times a year. This particular schedule has 20 meetings per year. Uh, secondly, it appears that this particular line item was uh, submitted by the superintendent. I would think that the board would want to submit when the board meets. Um, so that's something that's uh, that's a, a question to me uh, because I thought the board should should decide that. And further, I also think that this particular item ha needs to have further discussion and input from the community because, after all, we are the board, you know, that represents our community. So uh, my concern on this particular issue is that you know is Tuesday a good time? Now I'll tell you from my own personal perspective that from as a someone who has a full-time job during the week that a Monday meeting actually works much better for work schedule as opposed to being in the middle or toward the middle of the week um, because that's fairly it's highly disruptive but that's my own uh, my own two cents I'm more concerned about what the community's input on this and because I don't have any say so as to what becomes a consent calendar item or what doesn't become a consent calendar item uh, I think that this may be something that we should may pull or at least have some type of further discussion as a board about whether or not this is something the board really wants to move forward with as opposed to just appearing on the calendar and without really 
any forewarning about it. So the way the board sets its agenda every two weeks is the vice chair and the chair meet with Dr. Hargens and approve what goes on. This has gone through that process and it has been available to you for consideration and discussion since Wednesday of last week. So um, the expectation is that all items on the consent calendar will receive um, input um, if possible by close of business Friday which Dr. Hargens will then direct to the relevant uh, person. That's the way the board has agreed to work together and um, we always try to. Now we don't always have a chance to do that. Um, this item is put forward for 2016 and if there are concrete issues, I mean Dr. Hargens can explain why she thinks Tuesday might be better than Monday but I think the you know the gist of it was rather than have a work session where everybody takes out their calendars we should see whether we can just let fly with this and get it to work. I mean, it's plenty of time in advance. Does anybody else have a view on this? I Linda? have one comment about Sorry, that. Sorry, I'll come back to you. Linda? Well, I just, uh, for, for me, I, the only issue I had was around November, and I just wanted us to think if we wanted the third, uh, uh, to do the third and fifth Monday, or <laughs> Tuesday in November, or the in that case, maybe we could do the second and fourth because of the uh, lateness. Uh, it puts the November meeting. Right. And I think it. that was answered. You want, Donna, why don't you address? Yeah, the if why you stayed uh, in here. November with the second and fourth Tuesdays, it would fall on presidential election day in November 2016. And the presidential election day is a legal holiday for employees. Yeah. So that's the reason why uh, Kathy caught it and recommended and we can do it there's enough space in the week and we feel like we can um, um, make sure that anything that's brought to the board for approval with one meeting in October the other thing with moving to Tuesdays is we still intend to have your meeting materials ready on Wednesday but if you have questions or for clarifications then you have Monday uh, to actually ask staff or to actually meet with staff or whatever you need our job is to make sure you have the information you need to make decisions. So Tuesday gives you that additional day to do that. And that's why the recommendation is. Uh, and we always, we always bring forward dates for the next year um, at this time of the year. Okay, Chris. To go back to the further concern about having a time to discuss things or to send in a question, questions is fine, but my concern about this particular issue, because it affects the entire board, is we give any opportunity to discuss it. To discuss it through email, back and forth, actually violates, in my view, and possibly Frank can chime in on this, would, vi would violate the open meetings uh, state you know, laws. Uh, because we are having this open discussion that is part of a public institution of publicly elected right. officials. So the, the procedure for doing that is um, we are, you have pulled it down from the consent calendar. Um, you have made your perspective known. And it is now your right to make a motion to defer it, to table it, to come up with a different idea, whatever you want, and then the board will proceed as it does to make a decision um, as a group. Uh, I would but, like to vote on this item separately. Okay, so you're, are you making a motion that yes. we table this? I would make, no, I'd like, like to make a motion that we vote on this item separately uh, from already, the consent calendar. We're discussing it, okay, but that's voting fine. it. All right, so. Um, it is off the consent calendar because it will not be unanimously consented to. So um, we will then come back to it um, in a minute. So that concludes the review of items on the consent calendar. Um, so is there a motion to approve the consent calendar absent item T? Lisa moves, Diane seconds, all in favor? Aye. Okay, um, is there a motion to approve item T the um, board calendar. Steph moves. Okay, Diane seconds. All in favor? Opposed? Okay, great. The calendar is set. Um, thank you. Now we go on to board reports, requests, and planning calendar. Um, are there board reports? Diane. Then you can be a request. <laughs> Reports of requests, and then we'll do the planning count. Okay. Under board request, I would like for the board to be updated on a monthly basis on staffing. 
we received one report on staffing at when I requested it at another time. When school started, we showed 60 plus vacancies in schools and um, I think it's important for the board to know. We heard today in our work session about the importance of having teachers in place. So if we could have a monthly update on uh, staffing until we know that all of our schools are, are properly staffed, that would be helpful. Under Head Start, uh, we approved something, the signing tonight, but it appears that Head Start Early Childhood is being reorganized and I would request a work session for the board to know what the reorganization is going to look like, what the professional development is going to look like, and how it will impact the enrollment in this district uh, because we have moved some classes from schools. Then I would like an update on Manor Daniels. We talked a long time ago about the plan. What is the plan for Manor Daniels? And I'm not sure that we've seen that. I appreciate what Dr. Hargan shared with us tonight but it would also be helpful for the board to know the monthly uh, student movement in the building because at this point some students have left the facilities and other students have come back into the facility. I think we have all made a pledge to make sure that we are here to support, to give resources, but to also be accountable to all of our facilities and I would, as a board member, would like for the board to receive more timely information about Minor Daniels and there was to be a uh, community committee set up. If that has been set up, who is on it and when are the meetings being held? That completes my request. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Others? Lisa? Uh, okay, so we had a work session earlier today and it was going to include information about the priority schools. Uh, and the presentation we had was so engrossing and, and wonderful, really, that we didn't get to that. Um, but I did promise some of my constituents that I would ask. Uh, so one of the schools, Moore Middle, uh, in the district that, I'm, that I represent has moved into priority status. And I'm getting messages that there's a lot of anxiety within the school and within the community about what that means. Um, that there's this sense that the other shoe is going to drop and nobody knows when or what that is. And so just uh, I said that I would raise that concern and make the request that some communication could be given to the community on that. Um, let's see, a couple of times I've uh, requested and others I think have as well a work session on the alternative schools in general. Uh, just the, the plan that was the, that the board approved back in March was not just for Minor Daniels but for the whole system of alternative schools. So would love to have a work session and update on that. Um, some really, I, I think, great things going on. Uh, I was delighted uh, to read in the consent calendar the blended early childhood classrooms. I'm eager to learn more, but I think that's a great move toward equity uh, when we have certified teachers in every classroom and we don't have different sets of less qualified teachers for some groups of children. So I, I think that is a very, very positive uh, direction. I'm very pleased about that that. Um, I just want to personally congratulate Dr. Dossett. Uh, it's really exciting to see a promotion up through the ranks and we've been seeing your presentations and how you stepped in so capably and I just a personal uh, thank you and congratulations to you. Um, I also just want to mention that there was an NEA uh, Today article, National Press, and I've shared it with board members, uh, about the really exciting work that this board is doing. It's about uh, JCPS board and educators working together in our upcoming strategic plan to streamline testing to create more space for teaching and for teacher-led assessment. Uh, so that was really exciting to see Louisville get that big shout out for what we've all been so focused on for the past several months. Uh, and then finally, I just want to mention, because um, I've been in denial that I'm actually leaving town tomorrow, uh, but I'm going to, uh, it's the first
first annual convening, we'll see if there's a second one, of um, school board members from across the, the country, and it's in Los Angeles. Um, and I'll be there um, just for a couple of days to meet with and hear from uh, folks from the National Education Association and uh, school board members from all over the country to hear some of the great progress that they're making. And I'll have lots to brag about about what's going on here. Great. Thank you. Linda? Um, I would like to request from Cordelia. Uh, the Last year we had attained, we used the TAIN money uh, for after school programs and uh, I would just like to know what happened to that money and also I would like to know what our Section 7 money is paying for uh, this year, how that was, was parceled out, um, just to keep kind of a tab on, on uh, those changes that we made. Um, I, had, um, I, I was here this morning and listened to Dr. Ming um, who talked about the um, aligning learning with lifetime outcomes? I guess that's what it was said, what it said. But it was a it was a wonderful presentation on uh, and a and a device or a program that's being used uh, where text messages go to parents to uh, remind them to ask questions um, throughout the day that will help kids develop emotionally. But it was. Uh, it was quite a fascinating uh, presentation, and she reinforced the fact that test scores are not predictors of lifetime outcomes and lifetime success test scores. And we, you know, we've, I've heard that before. Uh, we worry about comparing our test scores to other countries' test scores, but uh, they are not good predictors of uh, lifetime productivity. Uh, I also. Um, of course, I've continued the making the connection visits with uh, <coughs> Olmstead South, and I have one in the morning at uh, Knight Middle School. Um, but in, and I observed a, a great lesson at Olmstead South on uh, the use of how math is being taught in, in a particular way. It's, it's almost like hovering over a concept and going very deep on a concept with a class, and and watching watching those kids um, work through kind of a Socratic method, just uh, questioning, questioning until the kids come up with the answers. But anyway, that was quite fascinating. Also had a, a, a great meeting with um, Commissioner Pruitt. Uh, we had our Commissioner's School Board Member Advisory Council meeting um, the past week. And it, there were only five of us there um, because so many of them could not make that meeting. But it was uh, what a wonderful opportunity for me to get to talk about things in our accountability system that um, I would love for him to take a look at. But it, it included the questions about ESL and how we don't support ESL as soon as ESL, the state doesn't, as soon as they cross proficiency, support kind of goes away. And in the testing, some of the directions for uh, ESL students, um, they get explanations in the directions, but then they don't get any more explanation throughout the test. Well, those are little technical things. One thing I did bring up to him was also how uh, we count our African students and our African American students together. We combined those scores, and it was clearly like that on uh, the accountability chart that we were looking at while we were there. And I asked him about that, and uh, he was going to take a look at that. But, Oh, we talked about so many things, great things, um, transportation, funding for transportation for SEEK and um, for our ESL students and um, grading scales and also ranking and why in the world, if schools are not serving the same groups of kids, what does ranking do? What function does ranking serve? Anyway, I had a chance to, Thank you, to Linda. discuss it. Okay, Chuck. Yeah, I want to a um, couple things. I want to I want to add to the course of uh, Board Member Wilner and Board Member um, um, Porter. I'd like to hear more about the Miners Daniel on a regular basis too. So I want to be in that chorus. I also uh, want to ask if we could have some kind of snapshot of teacher absenteeism rates um, around the district in the past couple of years. And then um, Dr. Razor's already started uh, giving me some information about the supply of substitute teachers and how we're doing there in that case. And then just as a matter of cleaning up something, Chair Jones, I said 
at this time two weeks ago we'd have a financial working group yeah. um, or presentation uh, as you know yeah. we've talked about that and that is scheduled uh, for November 9th we'll have a half an hour Great. Or so. we're looking forward to that okay thank you Steph? Um, just a, a report that I'd like to request. Um, I noticed on the um, review of um, our progress that 10% of the um, advanced program students were not proficient or distinguished. And so I would like to see information on you know, what type of um, <coughs> interventions and how you know, we are doing for um, that group and then also, you know, whether there really is an effort to do individualized learning plans for our gifted and talented, especially the ones, obviously, that are, you know, if they're not proficient or distinguished. Um, I also wanted to congratulate Dr. Dossett um, for joining, um, you know, as a director, it's very exciting and, uh, you know, for us to have you in the, this place at this time and also for the others that are stepping up around you as directors and doing a lot of work so hopefully you'll be joined soon by some other colleagues. Um, I attended the GLI glide trip and uh, our community, um, our schools, um, you know with Dr. Hargens, our schools we found they, they didn't really want to talk about education in Portland um, or really the arts. That wasn't really you know their high priorities. Um, and so there were some interesting con contrasts with our community, um, our Cradle to Career initiative and the collaboration that's going on in Louisville isn't unique, but um, it definitely uh, it stood out in, in that group. Also the arts collaboration with JCPS that we have going on is quite something. Um, and something to, to continue and really we can we pretty much that group all was very supportive of both of those things and then I'm um, very excited about the the votes today to ha you know pass the the boundaries for the new school it was a long time in coming um, Dr. Dossett was thank you for all that hard work and um, really helping us understand um, that, that we do have diversity you know, in, in our areas all, all over the county. Affordable housing obviously needs to catch up with us. But, um, and then just I'll leave you with a thought. I heard a great, great quote, very simple. But if nothing changes, then nothing changes. So that's kind of I see as a board, you know, things are changing um, and uh, we, we will you know, be a part of that change. So thank you. Okay, thank you. You got anything? Nope. Okay, I've got um, two pieces. First, um, for the board members, um, I guess make sure everybody's got the word, but mainly thank you. Dr. Thomas Alsbury will meet with us on uh, Wednesday the 11th to go over board best practices and his review and analysis of how this board is doing compared to um, board best practices and how we spend our time and structure our discussions. So um, appreciate everybody's um, working together to find a time that works for that. Um, second, I just want to report that um, last week I spent a couple hours at the Phoenix School of Discovery, which uh, was a very interesting couple hours. Um, the school has a new principal this year, Ken Moeller, and um, he has organized the school, which has been growing rapidly, um, into uh, seven what he calls houses. They're sort of like a British boarding school, more familiar as Harry Potter um, houses. And he asked me to come in and talk to students in two of those houses together, the Fox House, about 25 um, high school kids, and the Thunderbird House, another 25, so 50 high school kids, and um, he asked me to talk. The, the Fox House is focused on innovation as a kind of a career theme, Thunderbird on services, including healthcare services and social services. So he asked me to talk about those two themes, which uh, I did briefly and then invited questions. And the deal was uh, the kids could ask me anything they wanted and I uh, would in uh, turn get to ask them a question. Um, very impressive um, bunch of kids. I think there are a lot of, um, you know, a lot of students in the Phoenix School 
um, choose to be there because they find they don't quite fit in uh, the regular classrooms um, from around, but they were certainly um, bold and eloquent um, in the discussion, and I enjoyed it a lot. Um, they also had a lot of questions about the growth in their school and um, the changes, some of which are changes that we've heard of here in the revamping of the alternative schools. I'd say the biggest input was, gosh, you know, our classes last year, they were 15. This year, they're more like 22 kids on average, and that's a big change. Um, they also, um, in response to my questions, described how it seemed like about three quarters of the kids came because their parents and they had found out about this was a good school and maybe would be good for them, and 20 of them were assigned as part of the, you know, the changing um, allotment of um, students who've made bad behavioral choices. And um, it was a very productive, interactive um, discussion and, you know, left me feeling like I'm, you know, I'm, I'm really not very good at judging, um, you know, much from a walkthrough with the principal, but um, 50 high school kids are often going to tell you what they mm -hmm actually have on their mind um, if you invite them and uh, I thought they had a lot on their minds and they were um, fearless and well spoken in the way they expressed it so I left feeling um, encouraged that learning was going on there. Um, that's all I've got and now we can turn to the planning calendar which uh, you guys have before you. Any comments or requests concerning the planning calendar? And if not then a motion to approve it. Chuck moves it. Diane seconds. All in favor? Aye. Okay. Okay, so that passes unanimously. And now I believe we have, sorry. Um, we have two persons asking to speak on non agenda items. The first is Philip Setters. Philip Setters. Mr. Setters, you have three minutes. A bell will sound at the end of two and a half, and it will sound again twice at the end of three. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen of the board, my name is Philip Setters, and I am a disaffected parent. Quote, I will not be able to meet with you when your concerns have been addressed multiple times, but you don't agree with the outcome. Assistant Superintendent Michelle Dillard from an email to a parent that she had never met. A proclivity for deception or obfuscation of wrongdoing cannot be tolerated in a public agency, especially one into whose care we entrust our most precious assets. So the General Assembly has provided a few sunshine laws to ensure a measure of openness and transparency in government. The open record statutes are a perfect tool for exposing to public view what might otherwise remain hidden or secret. Those in the school district charged with responding to requests for open records are quick to cite the statutes in order to raise roadblocks, yet they just aren't as enthusiastic about actually following the law when it comes to producing responsive records. Did you know that just this past August 4th, the Attorney General admonished JCPS for subverting the intent of the Open Records Act and of violating KRS 61.880 <coughs> subsection 1? Interestingly, the then interim director of communications blamed JCPS failure to follow the law on, get this, personnel changes in the communications department. More of those pesky staffing holes. Back in February, Mr. Jones wrote, sunshine is the best disinfectant. My own experience in trying to obtain some transparency from this school district leaves me wondering who has lowered the blinds, drawn the curtains, and shuttered the windows. Mr. Jones, I'm standing in darkness, almost enveloped in silence. I sure could use a sunny day. In closing, I have one question and one request for you. Does the district have a legally qualified official custodian of records? As of last Tuesday, it was supposedly the Executive Director of Communications and Community Relations, but I don't think you actually have one of those employed. And finally, last week I asked Dr. Hargens for the student fees at Fern Creek High School that were approved by you for this school year and the previous one. In the interest of transparency and some sunshine, is there any chance you might ask her to provide that information sometime soon? It shouldn't be too difficult to find, and I'm fairly certain she has my email address. Thank you. 
Thank you very much. As is the pattern, Dr. Hargens will be asked to respond to you. Next is Gay Edelman. Gay, are you here? Yes. <coughs> Thank you for being with us and staying with us to the end. Thank you. My name is Gay Adelman. I am here on behalf of Dear JCPS. And as a representation of stakeholder feedback that we intend to bring to the board on a regular basis, I have some comments from some of our stakeholders. Uh, one was actually submitted to us during tonight's board meeting. And he says, watching tonight's board meeting has left me seriously nauseated and with a feeling of a very large knot in my stomach. I am deeply saddened to see the direction being laid by this group of board members concerning the new East End School. It is a clearly laid plan by JCPS to accommodate the wealthiest of Jefferson County who get what they want and to bus all others. How sad that our school system has come to this. You got your name and your diverse population without any consideration to the most social economic challenge and African American population of this county. Now we can all sit back and watch the scores of Chansey Elementary plummet. Also, um, I would like to read some comments from another priority school. Tonight my topic is priority schools. And priority, now. A thing that is regarded as more important than another. The right to take precedence or to proceed before others. Should a priority school have multiple teacher vacancies nine weeks into a 36, year, 36 week school year? Should a priority school have to wait until the day before school starts to get a principal, or go all summer without a principal, missing opportunities with full magnet recruiting goals, grant awards, hiring, etc.? Why are schools that meet their AMO year after year despite overcoming hurdle after hurdle still considered a priority? The reason is because they've reached the 16th percentile based on a locked goal, but because it is a moving target, they cannot actually get out of the bottom 5%. Just because a school is in the bottom 5% does not mean they are failing. When some schools get to handpick their students and have student populations with low poverty rates and a highly involved parent base are measured with the same measuring stick as a school that draws 90% of their population from a high poverty resides area, the game is rigged. These schools should be receiving accolades for fulfilling a badly needed role. Instead, they are demoralized and labeled a failure for serving high special needs and transient populations the second highest free and reduced lunch percentage, none of this is taken into account when comparing these schools. Yet despite all of this, the school has met AMO for three years in a row. They have the third highest pass rate in the district for AP tests last year. They've flown an experiment on, on, on board the International Space Station. They have students who are taking AP and dual credit courses and getting their pilot's license. Yes, I'm talking about the Academy at Shawnee. My son was an example of a successful student. He was recognized earlier this evening. Priority schools are not what people think. There are opportunities to, exceed, to su succeed in all of these schools. When the state requires change for the sake of change, a principal's job is consistent, consistently on the line. They are under a microscope. Who wants that job? Teachers feel feedback and concerns are not valued. Morale suffered, suffers. How can we ever recruit and retain quality instructor and leaders in that environment? We turn the boat around every couple of years and the momentum is lost and more kids get caught in the wake. Relationships are important, we heard that. The average principal tenure is 2.7 years. We must remove these barriers, remove the culture of fear. Where is the sense of urgency? Enough is enough. Thank, Thank you. you. All right. There is no need for an executive session tonight. So if there's motion to adjourn, Chuck moves. Diane seconds. <coughs> Thank you very much. Good night. Good night. Oh. <laughs>